Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me Bill and this time we're going to take a look at um, something from the east um, in this case something from the Soviet Union this is the VEF204 uh, made in Riga in Latvia and at the time this was made in about 1970-71 uh, Riga in Latvia was part of the Soviet Union so let's start first of all by having a look at uh, exactly what they got up to in Riga. Okay let's take a look at electronics um, in Riga in Latvia uh, and a bit of a timeline so in 1918 Latvia finally gained uh, its independence and in 1919 just a year later their company was set up PTVGD I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it but it's the postal and telegraphic uh, repair workshops and at the time their main production consisted of telephones of crystal radios and then eventually uh, telephone exchanges of which they were producing lots and lots in 1930 the Soviet Soviets occupied um, several of the Baltic states including Latvia and uh, very quickly they took over the uh, PTVGD factory and it became VEF again I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it, but essentially it's the state electrotechnical factory, and that's uh, the name it retains to this day. Uh, they, as well as making radios and telephones and telephone exchanges, they were now producing light bulbs, irons, flashlights, and cameras. Indeed, in 1936, they produced the Minox brand of camera. No idea why the Russians would need a small compact camera. Who would know that? In 1941-45, of course, was World War II and uh, Latvia was overrun by the Germans and uh, the factory suffered extensive damage. Got back on its feet fairly quickly again and by the 1960s it was a major producer of pretty much everything electronic. There's, depending which um, bit of information you read, they were making absolutely everything. But certainly in the 1960s they were producing seven radios and five telephones per minute. So a great a great number and presumably uh, re-equipping the country after the ravages of the Second World War. In the 60s and 70s the Spidola and the VEF portables were produced. The, the Spidola became a, a classic, very popular uh, inside the USSR. But the thing I remember most about that period of course is adverts like that in uh, magazines like Practical Wireless etc uh, where they were advertising these Russian uh, world beta radios. Uh, the unthinkable happened in 89 or maybe it wasn't unthinkable I don't know but that was the collapse of the USSR and in 1991 just under 70 years after it had got independence in the first place Latvia finally got independence back again. Um, by 1991 there was 20,000 people employed in, uh, in VEF um, the problem was in the mid 90s that it wasn't um, competitive with uh, some of the Western organizations so it was broken up into uh, half a dozen different diff companies one or two of which still exist but we are talking about a few hundred employees these days so nothing like its former glory okay well that's a, a potted history of, uh, of the VEF company which I hope was interesting it's a, a fascinating topic and uh, there's lots and lots of information out there but some of it's um, uh, a little bit contradictory sometimes and, and quite hard to understand but I've tried to put into that the bits that seem to be uh, consistent throughout the various websites and uh, documents that I read. So what's what's so special about this then? Well um, this is the 50th video and I thought as it was the 50th video um, I ought to do something uh, a little bit special certainly special from, from my point of view and that's because um, when I started this Lockdown Electronics YouTube channel back in July last year 2020 um, I hadn't really got any plans or great expectations and if you'd said to me you'll be doing your 50th video I'd have probably not believed them I thought it would have perhaps petered out after maybe half a dozen videos but here we are with video number 50 so clearly um, I'm still enjoying what I'm doing um, and I thought it was really appropriate to go back to this because um, for my 13th birthday back in 1971 uh, my father got me one of these this isn't the one I'm afraid that uh, that one's lost in the mists of time 
but I was um, an avid electronics um, enthusiast. I had a Philips electronic engineer as um, when I was about 10 or 11 and I was certainly interested in, in radio so he got me this it's um it's a broadcast band AM receiver it goes from 13 meters right up to long wave and he got it me from Stan Willits uh, electronics shop if anybody um, can remember Stan Willits electronics shop right at the top end of the high street in West Bromwich that was one of those old-fashioned electronics shops that are sadly missing now but I remember he got it for me and it was just the best present I could have had and I spent the next several years enjoying myself listening to the to the broadcast band stations and there were many more on shortwave bands then than there are now. Uh, pretty much every Eastern Bloc country had a fairly strong uh, English transmission so there was lots of stuff about five-year plans and um, how great um, the communist world was, how different it is to, um, to today. But yeah, um, so I enjoyed using it um, very much and back in April at the start of our lockdown um, in the UK uh, I saw this on eBay, I think it was about it was about £30 or something, maybe £35 and I, I took a chance um, not expecting very much and it's not in, in great condition but uh, I have got it working as you'll see later um, but what it did do, um, first of all it was a seriously good nostalgia trip which I won't apologise for but it set me off on a journey I um, changed quite a lot of the capacitors and one or two other components cleaned it up but what it did do it um, it got me into understanding again because I'd forgotten quite a lot that I, I've learnt in the past about how your classic super heterodyne receiver works so I've aligned it as best I can and it's been a really useful test bed and if you like a, a sort of a practice tool um, so I've got it here as I say not in, in great cosmetic condition but it does work and what I've learned from this um, it would be difficult to quantify it's lots and lots so let's now have a look um, how it works in terms of the circuit because it is a classic and then uh, we'll have a look at uh, the radio itself and, and what I've done to it so let's go this is the circuit diagram of the VEF 204 and if it looks slightly horrendously complicated on the left hand side these areas here are all the wave band and oscillator sections that are switched in and out on a, a carousel kind of device which I'll show you later on in the video um, so we can essentially uh, not worry about all those because there's only ever one in circuit at a time so here then is the carousel sections which are brought into uh, contact with the radio itself and the antenna sections and on the left hand side there are the um, components to do with the front end and the right hand side to do with the oscillator. Uh, here is uh, the oscillator and buffer and then here we've got the front end with these classic uh, Soviet top hat style transistors, very distinctive. Uh, that's followed by a classic IF stage, a number of um, IF uh, filters and uh, two or three stages of amplification. Finally there a germanium diode which you can just see a photograph of there which is the detector. Um, the resultant detected signals are then passed on to the first stage of AF amplification which includes on the left a volume control and on the right a tone control. Uh, the output of that is fed directly into the output stage which consists of three transistors, a driver transistor uh, T8 and then T9 and T10 work in a push-pull mode and you've got the two transformers um, providing the uh, the phase setup for the two uh, output stages to work as a, as a push-pull. So an absolute classic radio design. Here's a photograph of the inside of the circuit board from the VEF204 and this is uh, as uh, it arrived here and as you can see some very interesting looking components there those classic Soviet top hat transistors are very distinctive. Lots of capacitors, resistors, plenty of IF cans, a couple of transformers. Um, pretty standard stuff. And certainly when it comes to component identification, resistor codes are exactly the same. Uh, and it's pretty obvious which the electrolytic capacitors were. They were, they were pretty obviously polarised. But some of the others, I really wasn't sure what kind of capacitor they actually were. 
and having done quite a bit of research and listened to a couple of uh, Russian YouTube videos which had a, a bit of a translation on, I heard them talking about something called a gosht. So I had a search for this gosht and I came across this. And having uh, been involved with um, quality control um, through my life, I recognised that fairly quickly as being some kind of national standard, although my Russian is uh, non-existent. But it was quite fascinating to see the hammer and sickle at the top of that page. And that looked pretty much to me like a standard of the number 11076, probably from 1969. Uh, the great thing about the internet of course is Google Translate was able to tell me that it was this um, and it was a standard to do with uh, values of uh, capacitors and resistors and um, it was indeed uh, the official edition of the, of the standard. So Google Translate at least allowed me to work out what sort of capacitors they were and there was a fairly extensive recapping went on as you can see from that photograph. So next we'll move on and actually have a look at the radio itself. Here's the front of the radio and uh, it's not in too bad a nick really considering its age. We've got volume, tone is on the side here and this is the tuner and then the wave band is changed with this multi-position switch which makes a very um, satisfying clunk sound as it goes round and very reminds, takes me straight back to my childhood actually that noise it's very distinctive and the wave band that it's tuned to is shown in a little window here uh, and then you've got the various bands, long wave, medium wave, and then you've got 60, 41, 25, 19, 16, and 13. So it pretty much covers from about um, about 28 megahertz uh, right up to um, well, right up to long wave here. So right up to nearly um, well, 200 kilohertz. So so it's, uh, it's quite quite a good spread. Uh, that button there switches on a couple of uh, bulbs which you're not going to be able to see in this level of lighting there. They're pretty dim. They were both still working so I've, I've left them in as original. Um, but yeah altogether reasonably um, strong bit of kit um, and we'll now have a look in the back. Okay so here's the main circuit board and First thing to note is you can see it's been extensively recapped, uh, lots of um, polyester ones, but also electrolytics as well in quite a few places. One down there, and that one there was the replacement for this thing, which I've just dropped in there to give you an idea of size. Um, as you can see, modern replacement is considerably smaller than the Soviet one that came out of it, um, with its rather still probably can't see it terribly well on camera it's rather strange Cyrillic text okay distinctive features then these classic Soviet germanium transistors with a very unusual case look like top hats um, this is the RF front end oscillator and mixer here and then you've got the IF strip running along the bottom of the frame there with the IF amplification stages and then finally here a germanium diode just there which is the detector uh, followed by another stage of amplification and then you've got an absolute classic AF output stage which consists of a driver transistor here driving that transformer and the split phase output of that transformer is fed to this pair of transistors here working in push-pull mode uh, which drive that final output transformer which eventually drives the speaker so um, relatively easy recap um, for my first project because there's plenty of room on this circuit board um, so that was actually a, a great help. Okay well here she is switched on uh, currently on the um, 16 meter band section which is 16.6 um, up to just over 17 meters. Um, I've got it attached to my um, tri-band uh, vertical HF antenna just the um, center uh, conductor is attached so there isn't a place um, for an earth connection. So I just tune down, don't expect to find much on 16 meters. Mm -hmm. 
So away from the station, the Christian current's about um, about 80, 90 milliamps, and if I tune onto a station. We're straight up to about um, just at, at the strongest, we're up to about 120, 130. Oh, about, yep, about 200 and, yeah, about 250 milliamps there. Okay, we'll tune. Don't expect to find much there. We'll hop on to. 19 meters, just see if it's, oh, there you go. So as you can see she's working reasonably well around the HF broadcast bands. We'll finish off with the 25 metre band, we're just up on 31 metres here. Pretty sure that's the voice of Turkey. So, there you go, she's working fine on um, HF bands. Okay, well I hope you found that interesting. And uh, it certainly um, got me started again with, with electronics during lockdown. And uh, who would have thought back in April in 2020 that we'd still be locked down. Here we are now, just at the end of January in 21. Um, and I'm still enjoying doing the electronics and it's something I'm going to I'm going to keep up with now. But um, I thought this was perhaps just a great subject for video 50 because it's yeah um, something that's uh, meant quite a lot to me for quite a lot of years nearly 50 actually thanks very much for watching and particularly want to say this time that uh, I still I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the positive comments that I've been getting so I really appreciate your feedback and your comments and I really don't know what I expected but I've had some great comments from people um, so it's great that things that I'm doing are being appreciated so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and keep on with it and hopefully provide you with some some useful information and, and my slant on on this sort of technology so yeah if you like it please click the thumbs up if not you can click the thumbs down It'd be great if you could subscribe thanks very much for watching and we'll see you on video 51